in the first video I made after my break uh, in November, after no contact from the narcissist, I got a lot of questions about that video, about specifically, the specific question is, or the statement is, you're talking about your brother, right? And I am. And that leads to the questions of, well, what happened? Because you thought you had your brother's support at the beginning of all this. And, you know, well, what's the deal? So I'm going to go into this. I don't know how long it's going to go. I don't know where it's going to go. Uh, could end up being a very long video. But this is important for everybody to know and hear because I'm sure you've all had similar experiences with the golden child. Now, I've spoke spoke about my brother several times on this uh, on this channel. And I made it quite clear he was the golden child. I was the black sheep. But I've never really got in too deep to how much responsibility he really did play in all this. And then what led up to me finally breaking contact with him last June completely when he showed, you know, nothing has changed. Nothing. Now, I've talked about how my brother was put on a pedestal, how he's the golden child, how he participated in the gaslighting and the abuse in the house knowingly, knowingly. And it's far beyond your, your typical sibling rival, rivalries. Sorry about that word. It's far beyond that. It was to the point where he'd rile my mother up, get her going, and then go running for a baseball bat because I was so out of control to hit me with. And I, I think I've, I've mentioned that before, the get the bat Michael line, get the bat Michael, which I had to hear, and he would run and go get this wooden baseball bat that my mother would keep behind her bedroom door because apparently I was just so out of control at uh in, in in my teen years meanwhile i was never in trouble ever 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 but apparently i was this animal that had to be controlled with a uh with a louisville slugger baseball bat that uh my brother would actively go get and stand behind and laugh and you know the whole deal with, you know, what what a golden child would do. You know, I, I, I think I talked about the bathroom trick where I wasn't allowed to go to the bathroom for about two years because they would wait for me to go into the bathroom, hear the door lock, and then go bang on the door and tell me I have to get out, they have to use the bathroom. And I was relegated to, to last in line to use the bathroom. Or I had to use the one in the, uh, there was a single toilet in like a dirty, in a dirty closet, like in a dirty ba basement bathroom that would, didn't even have a sink, anything. So if you wanted to go down there with the spider webs and all that, 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 that was the one I could use. But for about two years, it was that. It was both my mother and my brother would do the same. As soon as they heard that door lock. And again, I talked about, you know, my birthdays where I would get beaten on my birthdays and my brother would have clowns and livestock brought in for his birthdays. So it was that kind of differential. You know, my food was rationed. He ate nothing but fried chicken and was completely about 100, was about 100 pounds overweight as a child because all he ate was fried chicken, tater tots, and yogurt. And that was his whole fucking diet. That was his whole fucking diet. Meanwhile, my food was rationed. 
and I had to go to school smelling like a chicken McNugget. And, I, and I've talked about this. And I used to tell, I remember, I used to tell my parents when, when I was a kid growing up. Because they used to put them, on the, like I said, they used to put them on a pedestal. My mother used to do all his homework for him. Literally did all his schoolwork for him throughout grade school and middle school. And then brag that he would get straight A's. Well, he's getting straight A's because you're doing childlike homework for him. And he's a year older than everyone else. I had, I had talked about that my mother threw me in school at kindergarten at four years old. My brother, they held my brother back until he was six. Was a year older than everyone. And he's getting straight A's with my mother doing all the schoolwork for him. And he's a genius. And I would tell them as a kid, I would tell them when I was a kid, because I'm six years old and then I'm, and I remember telling them, because I was a mouth, like if you challenge me, I would talk back to them. And I would tell them and I would tell him, that kid is fucking dumb. He's dumb as a box of rocks. He's a good bullshitter, but he's fucking dumb. And he is. He's dumb. And I told him, soon as, and I'm like, you know what, and I told my brother, and I remember, it's like, it was, because I used to have this fight with them, now it like comes back. And I would tell them, to tell the three of them, sitting there, in the back room, as I talked about, the back room was, was tribal council, where you would sit there, you know, in the spot of shame. I think I talked about that in the Narcissist Put You On Trial. And I remember standing there, and I'm like, he's dumb, and two of you are dumb. And you know what's going to happen? Eventually, the work's going to get too hard for the two of you, and he's going to start flunking. Well, right around high, as soon as high school started, guess what happened? And where did he end up going? Mr. 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 Honor Student Rhodes Scholar. Community College. That's right, Bergen Community College, Harvard on the fucking highway. You know, and it was, my brother could do no wrong. It was, you know, was, he had the nickname, I gave him the nickname, Precious. And my parents started just calling him that. Oh, precious, precious, precious. You see, the problem with precious, and that's how I refer to him now, now and forever, he's back to being precious or a little fat boy again. Because he used to cry. That was the one thing I could... Oh, he would cry. A little fat boy would cry. He'd cry when he didn't get his tots. He'd cry when he couldn't watch when 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 he couldn't watch Shira with his little girly cartoons that he would watch. Eating chicken, eating yogurt, dancing in his room to the dirty dancing soundtrack. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Fucking Patrick Swayze over there. But the problem is, and I used to tell him, there's going to come a time, Michael, when I leave here, and then it's going to be on you, and they are going to turn on you like fucking wild dogs. Like wild fucking dogs. And I moved out in 96, moved out in January, and I believe I spoke about this. His prom was at seven when he was 17. His prom was in April or the beginning of May. My mother found a marijuana seed in his car, then proceeded to turn him and his friends into the police for having weed, called all his parents, got him all this shit. Why? Because I wasn't at the house to fuck with anymore. So now my mother, not having me to fuck with anymore, 
only having him decided, well, you know what? I got, I got, I got to start a fight with him. I guess I got to start a fight. So my mother, just looking for something, decided to dig through his car. Found a marijuana seed because she was looking for fucking problems. And my brother couldn't even, how dare you even go through my car? He couldn't even fucking grasp. Like, what do you mean you're going to search my car? I'm not, I'm, I'm not Matthew. I'm me. What do you mean you're going to search my car? He couldn't fucking handle it. Lost his mind. Because he was the golden child all those years. He could do no wrong. But you're only going to be the golden child as long as you have the black sheep to kick around. Once I removed myself from the house and I didn't, she didn't have that immediate narcissistic supply, and my father too, they had to go turn their attention on him. So like I said, she turned him into the cops, called the cops, him and his friends. Now, mind you, his friends are everything to him. This kid to this day could give a fuck about anybody else, including probably his own wife at this point, and I'll get into that as well. Nobody comes before this kid's friends. I can't even call him a kid. He's in his 30s. Nobody comes before Precious's friends. And I'll tell you what that's probably about. Because he actually witnessed my mother getting, getting kicked out of her friendship at the, town, at, at the town swim club. Where my mother showed up, because my mother, as I said, my parents can never keep friends. Because they could never stop talking bullshit about their friends. They go to people's houses, they're having fun time. They're in the car, they're talking about them. They're talking about them. They're talking about them. Anytime you're in the car, they're talking shit. So that's the way they've always been. And the problem is when you talk so much shit, it gets back to people. And you forget who you talked what shit to. And it always ends up getting back. They've never really been able to maintain a long-term friendship for more than, I'd say, a year and a half, two years. Within... Nine, ten months, there's, a, there's usually problems. You can see there's problems in the friendship. And by a year and a half, two years, the, the thing's completely dissolved in meltdowns. And they usually end up in meltdowns with grown people having fights like cheerleaders at a lunch table. But the incident I'm talking about here, I wasn't there. My brother, I think he was like maybe six, seven years old. My mother shows up at the swim club and, you know, they hang out with the same group of friends and my, they've been talking about these friends. Same friends, mind you, that they had the fuck party with. I guess even when you're swapping dicks and whatever with, with each other's friends, you know, there's nothing sacred. God. Anyway, as the story goes, my mother shows up there were like four, it was like four different friend groups, like husband and wife groups that they would hang out with. But all the women, it was the four women were there, these. And my mother shows up with my brother. And the leader of the group, Roz, basically said, and this is my brother, this is my brother telling me this as a little kid. Says to says to my mother, Get the fuck out of here. Nobody wants you around anymore. We've all had it with you and fucking lays into her. In front of my mother and my little and my brother standing there. Just flat out rejected like, you know, something you'd see on TV, like on some movie, like that. And that's happened several times to my mother. But that one happened in front of my brother. Not that my brother didn't know about the other ones. But that one fucked him up, I think, because he saw my mother get rejected by her friends. And like, I think that's been his biggest fear is getting rejected by his friends. So this is the type. So my brother is, was the type growing up and, to the, and still to till this day. We'll, we'll leave you on this. Leave me on the side of the road or we'll leave his, you know, his family on the side of the road. OK, we'll run you over to go help his friends out. 
But the problem is his friends don't return the favor because his friends have always been nothing but a bunch of little fucking losers. Losers, users, and morons. And to give you a perfect example, one of his friends actually is the actor Jason Biggs. He used to sleep at my house. The American Pie kid, the kid who just fucking tweeted out the stupid jokes about that a Malaysian plane that got shot down. That's the mentality of my, my brother is actual real friends with that guy. And he's dumb as shit. He's dumb as shit. His family's fucked up. His sister, I went to school with his sister. His sister's fucked up. I'm telling you, it's that town of Hasbro Heights that fucks people up. Anyway, that's the mentality of his friends. He wasn't one of the ones, though. Jason wasn't one of the ones, though, that got caught smoking weed. These were his, like, close, close main friends that he would do anything for. So when, he, when they got caught smoking weed and my mother went and called the cops, you know, these friends that, you know, he was getting high with, what do they do? Now, I'm 41 years old. I know the friends I had, you know, one goes down, my, the friends I had, one of us went down, we all went down, and we didn't throw each other under the fucking bus. No, not these guys. They were pissed, knowing, knowing full well what a psychopath my mother is and what assholes my parents were. Everybody knew this. Everybody knew this at this point. So what did these great friends do to my brother? Stop talking to him. Talk shit about him. Vandalize his car. Ignore him. This happened at the end of his junior year. Ignore him for his entire senior year. Where now my brother's hanging out with underclassmen because none of his friends will talk to him. Until graduation approaches, of course. And then there's fish, there's a fish, there's fish concerts. Cool, my brother's the only one with a car still with all these fucking losers. None of them had cars. But there was fish concerts. So like fish was going on tour that year, and like, and they were gonna be on the East Coast. That they wanted to go up to Maine and New Hampshire. I'm like, oh like, let's let bygones be bygones, shoe. Oh, and can you fucking drive us? And there's Precious back driving, driving. So that's the premise. So when that happened, and my parents caught him with the with the weed. And like I said, like my these are guys. He's he's. He's smoking weed with, and they throw him under the bus. Like, I don't get it. Like, my friends I, I, I would get high with would, would hide a body for you. These fucking douchebags throw you under the bus like that. But I'm out of the house now for about three months. I'm living, you know, with my buddy. And my mother's telling me this. And instead of being like, yeah, good, serves him right, little fucker will get what he wants. Little fucker gets what he getting what he deserves. I got mad for him. Because he was my brother. And that's where the family thing kicked in for me. It didn't matter that he was part of my abuse, like the abuse and part of the problem, and he, like I hated his guts. At that point, I realized he was he was a victim too, because he had been put on this pedestal and he didn't know how to handle this. Now being now now, now you're the black sheep, bro. And he couldn't handle it, but I went to him. I defended him. Told my parents they were fucking assholes, you know. I was there for him. And it was at that moment I had let my past with him go. 
And I'm like, all right, we can be brothers at this point. So, now the years in between with me and him were fine. He was at the, after that happened with my parents, he became very standoffish. You know, he didn't let, he didn't let anybody know anything about his life. Everything was a, everything was a secret. Everything. Everything. Because he realized who my parents were. But he wasn't strong enough to cut the umbilical cord. And this is where we're going to get to how I ended up no contact with him. Through the years, he ended up moving out to Denver. I ended up getting divorced. You know, the rest of my channel speaks from, for itself as far as the relationship with my parents and him and me. So here's what happens. I'm on the phone with my brother, and I'm, I had already started this channel. And I had made the original six videos with the phone call from the narcissistic mother. And I told my brother about it, and he was all into it. And he goes, you know, I got to tell you. Mommy and daddy were out here a couple weeks ago. I'm like, okay. And daddy man said they were going to start looking for property out here in Denver. And I'm like, well, that's a fucking power move because he has no, they have no desire to live in the, the mountains, none whatsoever. They just can't stand that he's living like, like they feel like it's some kind of barrier, which it is. He's putting up a boundary. They're now trying to invade his boundary. So my brother says to him, this is where I live. And at that point, my brother, my father did to him what he's always done to me. He's looking for a fight. So what he did was he then snapped on my brother in my brother's living room, starts yelling at my brother, telling him off, telling him how he ran off to Denver and he did this and what a piece of shit he is in my brother's own living room. Now, I had warned my brother that this was coming, and he didn't want to listen. When he, before he got married, I was living in, when I first moved down here, I was living in Miami. And the first year I was down here, Hugh got married to his wife. But I got an invitation in the mail from my parents for his, um, for an engagement party or a wedding party from my parents for me. And <clears throat> so I called them and I'm like, well, what's this about, dude? Why are you letting them throw you a party? And he's like, well, you know, I have a different relationship with them. And, you know, he's giving me all the different. I'm like, Michael, if you do this, he's going to turn on you. You are setting yourself up for to be a pat. And he was inside, can do what I want. I have it. Don't don't profess to know your relationship with me and daddy. And the, do, what you, do whatever you want, bro. So fast forward to this conversation last June. Here it comes. Here's my father standing in the middle of his of his living room, telling him off like he did to me that time that I that I had mentioned. Same deal. Then went storming upstairs with my mother saying, we're leaving tomorrow. Didn't leave. Didn't leave, patched it up. So my brother's like, you know, you should make that, you should make that YouTube um, channel public. You should make it public and you should send the link to mommy and daddy. I'm like, yeah. He's like, yeah, after everything we've been through. And that guy we were talking, I was talking about the abuse, I was talking about the dick touch, and I was talking about all of it with him.
I make the channel public, send the link to my mother and father. The fight ensues on Facebook, not between me, between my wife and my parents. That night I get a call from my brother. Why is your wife writing that mommy touched me and on, on Facebook? I'm like, uh, did you not tell me to make this channel public, dude? Well, I don't know why she's doing that. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. I'm like, wait, we just discussed this last night, dude. Last night. So now my brother's trying to claim that nothing happened to him. And he didn't want to get involved. Regardless of the fact that he was told point blank by our therapist together, both were sexually abused. But whatever. Whatever. I'm like, Michael, you told me to make this thing public. Well, I didn't know you were going to involve me, and I didn't. my friends are going to see this. And then that's when I, um, your friends. And I told them. Fuck your friends. I don't give a fuck about your friends. And at the end of the day, that's all he cared about was his friends. And that revealed his true intent. You see, he realized I was right, that my father wasn't going to change. That he was in the same fucking boat that I was in. That now that I and now that I wasn't contacting them whatsoever, having no contact with them, now they were going to turn their sights on him again. Well, he couldn't have that. He thought by making the channel public that it was then going to flip the, the attention back on me so he can go back to going to do what he fucking does, burying his fucking head in the sand with one finger up his ass, the other up his nose, switch every half hour. Alternate nostrils on that, by the way. Because you don't want to get one side more shitty than the other. You're just going to have a bad time. And it was at that point I realized it doesn't matter if you're a golden child or you're or what you are. You gotta go. If you still have a relationship with the narcissist, you have to go. And once I made that decision that he had to go, I realized what a shitty brother he really had been. Through all my heartbreak and angst and everything that had been going on with this divorce, he sat at the Christmas table with my ex-wife and daughter. Broke bread with him. Had dinner with him. Had dinner with my mother and father. Even on the, while he's on the phone. Oh, this is horrible. At the first opportunity, I had that little faggot's back. He don't know how to be here because he's too too concerned with his friends. And I understand why it was that humiliation of losing something. And because he doesn't have a real family. But that's not my fucking problem anymore. He sat there at the dining room table multiple times with my ex-wife. If the true, if, 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 if roles were reversed, I'd have called everybody out at that goddamn table and say, how do you do this to, to my brother? I'd have pulled my ex-wife in the next room and be like, knock the shit off with my brother. Aaron, come here. Let's go talk to your father and put him on a, on a fucking webcam that I haven't been able to see my daughter for, on a webcam or for, for the four years I've been down here. Nobody can figure it out. He works for an IT company into it. He couldn't figure it out. Didn't even think to do it. Yet I'm giving this kid some kind of pass because he tells me, oh, yeah, it's terrible what, what everybody did to you. Then sits there and has friggin' Christmas with, with my ex-wife. This is why I say if they have relationship with the narcissist knowingly, and they know what the situation is, cut them out. They are poison. They are dangerous.
And to show you how, how troubling it is, the, the, the golden child dynamic. Because the problem is my brother never really did respect me. Because in his mind, he's been built up because he's not that bright. He's a good bullshitter. He's a good salesman. But he isn't very bright. He threatened me on the phone telling me that I will take a walk down the memory lane if I kept it up. He was going to hop a plane to Florida and deal with it. Which is most troubling when you consider the fact that this kid has never been in a fight in his life. In his life, he's never been in a fight. The closest he came to an actual physical altercation was him was me picking him up down on Long Beach Island at Bay Village because some skinny little Puerto Rican and a wife beater threatened him with a pocket knife. <laughs> I've been, and for him to to levy a threat, and that's where he gets his like he 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 breaks. He's a lot like my father, where he breaks into this rage hall, turns into a little rageaholic. Because the problem is, he's gonna rage a hall on the wrong fucking person one day. And get his neck snapped. See, the problem is, see, the thing is, if he showed up in Florida, he'd never be able to get me, get to me. Because he'd have to go through my wife first. And she is going to, if she ever sees him, I have no doubt, she's going to kick his fucking teeth down his throat. Because in this exchange, you know, he seemed to think he can say whatever he wants about my wife, because, you know, she's with me, so I could say whatever I want. I could say things like, you better put that bitch on a leash, and, you know, you better get that bitch under control. <sighs> no. This is from, a, this is from a, a, a guy who had not one, but two fiancés walk out on him. Two! And these great friends of his, the second fiancé, ended up coming back to New Jersey and fucking his best friend. All his friends knew it. And nobody, these great friends, he's so worried about finding out that his mommy might have touched his dick. Because they'll make fun of him in his thirties. These same fucking wonderful guy friends that he's so concerned about all knew that his ex-best friend was fucking his ex his ex fiance and nobody told him. Nobody told him until he was coming back to New Jersey to go to a wedding of one of those friends and they said, oh, by the way, by the way, your ex-fiance, who you've been talking to on the phone, is actually fucking OB. Your best friend, who she hated when you were in New Jersey living with him, forced you to move out by a condo because you couldn't stand him. Now it's here fucking him. Not only do these great friends not call him out and accept it, they don't even tell you until the last fucking minute. And that's who he... That's who he cares about. And that's what narcissistic abuse will do to you. That's how it'll fuck up a golden child. Screws with their heads. Because it's very hard for a golden child to stay a golden child without seeing the black sheep eventually come out. And once the black sheep tactics happen on a golden child, all hell breaks loose. All hell breaks loose. So that was the last time I talked to my brother, Precious. I don't need him. I don't want him. He needs his little umbilical cord back to New Jersey. That's fine. 
I was holding on because he was telling me, oh, yeah, I support you, and this is terrible. But his actions said otherwise. And if you analyze the actions of these of these people that maintain relationships with your narcissist knowingly, it's the same thing. We put up with it because we think we deserve it. Because we think that if we don't, we'll be alone for the rest. And that's not true. We're targeted because we're smarter. We're targeted because they saw something in us that they wanted to destroy. If you have these, you know who the dangerous people are, who the poison is in your life. You know already who needs to be cut out. You just need to do it. Because the longer you wait, the more time you're wasting. And the more time you waste, the, the longer it is for you to get to some semblance, to get to some sort of recovery. Cut them out. Okay, everybody. I'm going to cut the video here. Sorry it went so long. Um, it needed to be done, though. And I've been feeling like I've, there's been like a big portion of the story missing. And the last text I had sent to my brother was, you know, don't worry, I'll never mention you again. But fuck him. I could give a fuck. I could give a fuck. He wants to go hide out in Denver and go fucking do whatever he wants to do. You know, go bury his head in a ski slope while he gets high. And that's fine. That's fine. It does you no good to move 1,500 miles away if you're going to keep contact. None. So if you have these people in your life, cut them out. Cut them out now. This is Ali Matthews. Thanks for watching. I'll talk to you all again real soon. Thanks. Bye.